Uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, our, our building offline web applications. And uh, as I was introduced, I'm a developer at ThoughtWorks in the beautiful Hamburg office. And uh, the first time our client came to us, no, it doesn't work anymore, <laughs> and uh, told us about um, that they would like to build us an offline capable web application. That was kind of the face we made. That's actually a former colleague of mine, Lukas, and um, yeah, his uh, face is priceless. As a developer, when we hear about offline, or at least when we heard about this two years ago, uh, we thought about, oh, stale data, there's going to be merge conflicts, there's going to be, how do we like upgradability and how do we even test this? But actually, I mean, we're developers. We like to solve some nice little uh, puzzles and we actually went out there and had a look at the HTML5 technologies out there and thought, mm, this might not be a developer's nightmare uh, at all and maybe just a very nice challenge to solve. Um, but before we start talking about uh, solving offline, um, we should talk about what offline actually means. For us, offline is more than just a T-Rex in the Chrome browser. Offline also means having a really poor internet connection. Imagine going uh, on the tube and having only, being only connected via GPRS. Or um, just like uh, have very short connection losses, uh, walking uh, in big areas and losing connections to, um, to one router and the uh, connection loss until you connect to the next one. So you might ask yourself, why do we need to build an offline capable web application? Um, why is that a use case? And actually, we didn't think about this before, but actually two, um, two clients approached us uh, very individually. One was in, the, um, uh, in ThoughtWorks UK and one was in ThoughtWorks Germany. And these are actually the two use cases I'm going to talk about today. The first one is um, it was a big uh, um, grocery chain in the UK. It's called Morrison's. And they wanted to go from paper-based ordering to tablet-based ordering. So what they did, they um, uh, before they had a huge stack of paper, and they went through the store, stores and checked what needs to be um, restocked. So they went there and said, like, OK, here uh, we can see the um, something is, uh, is running out of uh, product. We need to order more. And um, for that, they didn't want to decide on what kind of tablet they want to use. So they decided to make an HTML5 app. And then, um, yeah, and then they had the problem that a big supermarket chain is actually not the best place to, uh, to ensure a good Wi-Fi connection. Uh, first of all, it's really big. So you will have connection losses uh, walking uh, uh, through the store and uh, losing connection to one router and until you connect to the next one. The second one is it has really big metal shelves, which are also not helping here. And the third one was they actually have really big um, walk-in freezers where they keep all the dairy products. And uh, they're really good at keeping the uh, cold in, but also keeping the Wi-Fi out. So for that, they needed uh, kind of that offline capability. And the second client that approached us is a <clears throat> uh, big retailer in Germany. And they sell all different kind of products. Every week, they have different kind of products in their shop. And they have something that they call, or we call, traveling product testers. So what we did for them was kind of a Google Docs thing with like pre-filled text, text that they could add. And what these traveling product testers do, they uh, write specifications where they specify how their products should look like. And then they uh, go to the manufacturer line right away, take sample products right out of the manufacturing line, and uh, take notes, take pictures, add that to their specifications. And in these manufacturing lines, they usually don't have uh, big manufacturing halls. They usually don't have Wi-Fi. So these are the two scenarios that we have. They have kind of the same uh, issue here. And um, we uh, solve that still. Um, very different, and that's uh, it's gonna follow. So, how did we how did we approach those um, two problems, or this one problem for two clients? And um, I'm gonna talk about three different. I clustered this in three different steps. If you want to make your web application um, be uh, offline capable, you of course want to have your app uh, in the browser. You somehow want to install that application in the browser, or that's one way you can do it. Another. <coughs> Uh, second step, you of course want to have the data in your browser as well. And uh, the third one, 
If you reconnect to the, uh, to the internet, you also want to make sure how you handle the data changes that happened offline. So um, how do you install <laughs> your application in your browser? Um, so there is a bit older, techno oldish technology to do that. It's called application cache, app cache. And um, app cache is an additional cache. And uh, that uh, makes sure that all your JavaScript, HTML, and CSS files are stored in your browser and not lost when the connection is uh, going missing. So um, every time you have a new, um, a new version of your software on, uh, on your um, web server, uh, every client that can connect to your server gets the newest version of your application. And the ones that uh, are not going to offline keep the ones, the version that they currently have. Um, we can have a brief look how this works. It basically just contains of two things. You need to have a uh, specify a manifest file that you specify in your index.html, and then you write the manifest file, which is um, very straightforward. It starts with a simple line, cache manifest. And then um, you decide what you want to have uh, served out of the cache. So um, all your uh, HTML, files, icons, images, and all the JavaScript you would like to be served out of the cache. Then you define what uh, should still get served um, from the network. And a lesson to learn for us was uh, that this is whitelist everything. Because if you have any link in your application, for example, to Google or Facebook integration, and it's not whitelisted, uh, app cache will try to serve it out of the cache, <laughs> which is, of course, uh, not going to happen. So. Uh, the list in the cache has higher priority than in the network. Um, that's why you can just whitelist list everything. Um, you can also specify a fallback in case you're really offline, cannot access Google or anything. Um, uh, you still have an uh, offline fallback. And you saw there's still one thing missing. Um, that's just a minor hint. If you um, Usually, if you do a web application, you pre-compile all your JavaScript into one file that's in a scripts folder in a scripts.js. It's called scripts.js. And the app cache um, uh, detects changes um, by just building a hash over its own file. So if you have your pre-compiled JavaScript, it will not realize that something changed. But if you want the app cache to realize that there's a new version of your software, just put in a random string. For us, that was a date. So that helps you to. Um, so that app cache knows that you have a new version of it. And um, this is actually a screenshot of our application. And um, we tried to go a bit with the look and feel of installing an application in the browser. So that's what the user saw. You actually, with app cache, get also a bit of eventing. So you can actually like uh, see that you know uh, the process of installing or downloading the application in the browser is still happening, and you can like go as far as you want with that. And we tried to give it a bit of a look and feel of downloading something. Um, an oldie but goldie, application cache is a douchebag. So app cache has its, um, its pitfalls. It's not the nicest API to use. Um, <laughs> fun thing you can Google is uh, uh, manifest files and uh, max age headers. <laughs> And uh, yeah, there's just a nice article. So if you have to deal with app cache, I would recommend this over any other documentation. But there's hope. Um, uh, besides app cache, you could use service workers. Um, service workers, at the time we started, um, which was more than two and a half years ago, were not available. But app cache was in most browsers. So um, app cache is a programmable proxy or programmable uh, proxy in cache. And um, your application, it's basically a, <laughs> a layer um, in between your rich internet application where you can decide um, if app cache should serve uh, from the internet or from the cache itself. So this is actually really nice. And the nicest thing is your, instead of app cache where you have fully automation and no control with that, this one, um, you have full control. You can reroute. You can invalidate the cache um, and all of the things. Um, but uh, with service workers, also, you need to implement that yourself. Um, yeah, so after you have your application 
available in the browser, you of course want to know how do I deal with my data. And uh, um, my colleagues in the UK for their for the their application was called Ordapad for the Morrison. They used web storage, and web storage is a very simple key value store with a synchronous API. It's very easy to use, and uh, I can very much recommend that if that suits uh, your needs. In uh, our case, the project I was on, we did use uh, uh, local storage in the beginning, um, and then we switched to IndexedDB. This had um, basically three reasons. First of all, um, uh, local storage did just not offer enough uh, space. Our data was bigger. We have um, very big and long files um, that we stored as JSON. And uh, there are tables, lists, images in it, so it was uh, kind of a big document. Um, and uh, the distribution, how for at least Chrome handles the um, disk space for uh, IndexedDB was a bit, uh, or gave us more space than it was with local storage. I think it was 5 MB at the time, it is 10 MB now, I'm not entirely sure. And um, the second thing is, as the name implies, uh, IndexedDB has indices. So we were able to place queries, we're able to say which document has been written by that person in the period of time X. So, um, and as I said, we used local storage at the very beginning for kind of our MVP, minimal variable product, at the very beginning. And um, we just realized at one point that our data got messed up, and we didn't know why. So we were looking um, at how the users use our application, and we figured out that they actually open the application in multiple tabs and work on multiple um, versions of a document at the same time. And um, yeah, so that's when we realized that our single-threaded JavaScript suddenly got multi-threaded. And uh, <laughs> at that time, we also wanted to have something like locking transactions that IndexedDB uh, actually gives us. Um, so we can have a very brief look at the API of IndexedDB. It is um, very easy and very descriptive here. So you open a new database by just specifying a name and the version you want to have your database in. And that also means your name is your unique identifier, and you can actually have multiple databases for the same application. Oh, and you can also see it is event-based, so you don't get a database back, but you get a, a database request back. If you want to place a transaction, you just uh, specify the stores the transactions are gonna be on, and a transaction type, which can be read-only or read-write, and you require the stores, uh, do the request, listen on the on success event or on failure, of course, and then proceed with the data. Um, one more uh, thing is that I found surprising um, when using other data databases, um, I wasn't uh, used to handling my indices myself. I, um, this is a bit different in IndexedDB, so, so you can see if you want to iterate over your data um, with a cursor, you need to, you're responsible for your indices and setting your key range. But the same here, you listen to the on success event. So it is, uh, um, it is an, <laughs> an okay API to use, but um, um, be aware of a bit uh, difficult API. Um, Another thing that I found uh, particularly interesting in the project was how we dealt, dealt with migrations. Migrations was something that we postponed for quite a while, for at least half a year. We thought, can we do this without any migrations? And I know that uh, technically IndexedDB and also MongoDB, so a database that we use in the backend, are technically schemaless. Of course, we do have a schema that describes what we store in the database, and then after a while, you're gonna need to do some cleanup. <laughs> and um, so how did we handle migrations? Because there's also, um, of course, multiple ways on how we could deal with migrations. We could say we do server-side migration only. But um, at this time, we uh, decided to go, um, we do a server-side and client-side migration approach, which actually worked fine for us. So, what do, we, what do we do if uh, we have a migration coming up? Imagine migration, of course, number 42 is coming up. Our, um, we use Java in the backend. There's also no um, other reason than the client wanted us to use Java in the backend, so that's why we have it. And um, 
So once our spring context starts, um, we migrate all the data on, the, on our MongoDB. And then um, as soon as a client connects, they get the new version of the application and what I just showed with AppCache, or uh, then we could also do with service workers. Um, you get a, um, with that new application um, files, you also get a migration.js file. And that migration.js file <coughs> does the migration on the client side on the index DB. And um, one more thing that I found also uh, very fun was um, we didn't want to share that, or we didn't want to write a migration file or my, how to migrate in Java and JavaScript. And instead, we wanted to sh share that piece of business logic. So um, we actually decided to use um, Nashorn. Nashorn is a uh, Java engine that lets you execute JavaScript in Java. And it's the re-implementation of Rhino. So um, we used uh, Nashorn to um, only have our migration in the migrations JS file and then be executed on the server side as well. Um, yeah, last but not least, the data changes uh, that happened offline. So um, I start again with the Morrison example, the uh, order pad um, thing. So uh, when I talked to them, they told me that the biggest breakthrough for them was when they realized or when they thought of their, um, of their updates in terms of commands. So. Um, now they decided, or they um, they thought if if we need to restock something, then we like uh, we're gonna specify a product, the quantity we want to have or order, and then this is gonna be an update order command, and um, this made it uh, uh, quite handy for them. Uh, first of all, they were able to just like place uh, all of the orders that came in into a queue, and they needed to persist that queue. Um, so they wrote a, um, a uh, easy message processor for that, and that decided if the, the backend was able to store or how far the backend came with like synchronizing the items in the queue. So this was, first of all, easy because that's an easy concept to understand for developers, and that's also very easy to understand for a user. If the user gets an error message, like I couldn't place that muesli order that you want to have five new muesli packages, please redo or refresh. That's something a user can understand and then work on that. So you don't even have to resolve um, um, uh, failing backends or even, uh, even conflicts. Um, so here, this is something that can be uh, more easily solved for a user perspective. Um, but in our case, the traveling product tester, people were writing documents. And so, which means every keystroke, if we would have thought of this in terms of commands, every keystroke would have been a change, right? Keystroke, oh, document changed. Keystroke, document changed. Keystroke, document changed. And it would not be very, um, uh, neither for us nor for the user. So this is like, just to explain the slide, this is how our changes would have looked. And our users are not developers, and so they're not familiar with reading divs. And even for us, like reading divs of two different long JSON files is not something um, <laughs> we enjoy very much. So um, we decided to go, instead of going with the command pattern, um, that's actually described in the Gang of Four book, and it, both of those patterns are described in the um, uh, redo undo section. So they used the command pattern and we decided to go with something uh, that they described as memento pattern. So we remember the state of the, the document uh, at a time. We um, remember that, memento. And then uh, after five seconds, we take the state of the document and we remember that. Um, so how did we do this? So first of all, the client types something. And then we have a uh, JavaScript component uh, called repository that like, lets it write straight to the index DB. So every keystroke, right to the index DB. What this repository then does, it does also store some meta information about this in a queue. So also have a queue here. This is a very shortened version of that meta information, but it stores in a queue um, 
the ID of the document, which says item here, but it's the document. Um, it says that it is queued now. It's not in conflict. It has no sync errors. And the queue um, <coughs> writes that straight to the index DB. And then we decided to go in a five second cycle. This is something, it's an arbitrary number. You can choose for yourself what suits best. Um, the queue notifies the repository. Um, so because queues only, um, is only responsible for the synchronization, but not for the connection or the, um, uh, for the actual synchronization with the backend. What the repository then does is it connects to the internet if possible and uh, sets the, um, the uh, it's not queued anymore and it's currently in synchronization. So, um, um, but just in case the synchronization takes longer than this or the user is still typing and we still have changes, what do we do then? Then we actually um, uh, do the same cycle again and uh, set the item or the document itself to queued again. So our current document is not only queued, it's, it's not only synchronized, it's also uh, in the queue again. So the next five second cycle is over, we take the new state of the document and resync it again. Um, that is how we dealt with uh, data changes. And um, another uh, interesting thing is that actually these five seconds are not that easy to detect, <laughs> um, at least for us. So we didn't want, if the user has the application open in multiple tabs, we didn't want to have like each tab synchronizing in a five, uh, five second cycle off by one or two seconds. Um, that's why we use shared web worker. It's the same as a web worker and it's um, just shared across tabs. So the way we implemented it, this web worker chooses a random tab and says, you do synchronize. And then we, um, we ask our backend, are you on? Because as I mentioned before, offline um, is a harder thing to detect or not hard to detect, but you should think a bit about it because just using the navigator offline property of your browser doesn't help here. This just says you're connected to any, any internet, but not the internet. And it also um, doesn't, you might even be connected to the internet, but our, um, our uh, server's down. So what this does, it pings our server constantly and then says, um, and then our server hopefully responds with yes, 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 I'm online. And um, then the service worker um, notifies all the applications so that the user knows uh, if the application or is currently online or offline. Because that's a crucial thing to know, right? If you're typing, there's no save button and nothing, and you just hope that it gets synchronized, you want to at least have a little hint that you're still connected to the internet. Um, yeah, so... Um, what is it now? What can we say after saw, seeing these two uh, kind of different um, approaches? Is it a developer's nightmare or is it just a nice little set challenge to solve? And actually, I cannot, um, I cannot really say in summary, um, but I can, um, how that would work for you, but I can um, maybe give a good little bit of guidelines of the questions we asked ourselves in order to choose the right technologies or how to approach this problem. And first of all, it's the size of the data. If you need to build an offline capable web application, think of how big your data is going to be. Um, I would prefer web storage or local storage if there's enough space, if my data is small and I just need to persist a little bit of queue of the update commands, that's perfectly fine. That's going to um, be sufficient. But uh, if I have to use uh, long JSON files um, and want to query over that, that might not be the right choice. So another thing is the structure of the data. We have been very lucky. So our, uh, in, both, in both cases, the data itself didn't have many relations to each other. So one document had very few connections to another document. Um, if you have... Um, highly uh, coupled data, then you might want to think of a very different technology. And also, if you then use a different technology in the backend, you're not using MongoDB, but you're using a, a SQL database, then you also might want to switch that in the client. And there are <coughs> um, uh, 
SQL databases available for browsers. I'm not entirely sure the one I knew was deprecated now. So, but that's something you need to consider, right? These two technologies at least should be similar. Otherwise, it gets really hard to um, to merge uh, <laughs> or to keep them both in sync. So, another thing is uh, potential of data conflicts. So. Um, we also have been very lucky that both clients said conflicts do occur, but they're not a major priority. So for, um, for Morrison, that meant usually only one person is standing in one aisle and updating that same product at the same time, right? Otherwise, otherwise it will always be the last wins, right? So um, um, for them, they said, like, it can occur. It's nothing you should worry. Um, and for the traveling product tester, it's the same. Usually one person is uh, responsible for editing one document. It can happen that a colleague um, uh, also edits the same document, but then we should only um, show the user that a conflict uh, occurs, and, um, that, um, but we don't need to auto-merge or resolve it. Even though we are on a level where we could actually do this, we can make divs over JSONs, but this is always the question how much um, uh, how do like how far do we want to go here, right? Um, and uh, how much time do we actually have if the client says this is not a priority? Uh, another thing is browser support. So the technologies I showed today, except the, um, the uh, programmable proxy or uh, programmable cache, are all available for major browsers. I'm not sure about mobile browsers. Um, but if you want to store images and um, synchronize image images, that's going to be hard. Um, there's currently the file API and the file system API that can, the file system API can only be used in Chrome. So, um, yeah, if you have to support all major browsers, uh, this is going to be, um, uh, you might need to consider other technology options. Um, also, one thing when talking about uh, uh, storing data in a browser, you need to consider what kind of data are we uh, talking about. If it's confidential, um, this might also not be a good idea because all of those technologies don't um, uh, don't have encryption coming right uh, coming for free. So uh, you need to be aware that all your data that you're synchronizing between backend and frontend are in clear clear text on every um, user's machine. So. And uh, last but not least, a very obvious one, but still something that uh, we can easily forget, is the amount of functionality that actually has to work offline. When we hear that and see all the nice technologies, we get so overwhelmed, we want to do everything offline. But um, yeah, make sure that you um, check out your priorities, because both of our applications did not work fully offline. So um, the major part, but not everything. So I talked a lot about the development process on how we developed uh, offline capable web applications. But um, after now two years running in production, we still have some so unsolved changes. And this is storage management. Um, so our data is too big that all of the data that's on, uh, that's on server side fits on a client's computer. So um, that means you always have the trouble that if the user wants to have certain documents available offline, at some point, their hard drive will fill up and there will not be enough space. And especially because it's tied to your um, hard drive space, Chrome decides on like half of it and then you get a third for each application. It's, uh, um, yeah. yeah, it's actually a simple formula. But um, yeah, what do people do when they go on a long trip and won't have internet? Like they go to the manufacturing line in, uh, in uh, Bangalore, they load, uh, they download a bunch of Doctor Who episodes, then their hard drive is full, they open their computer, and then like all the documents are gone. So uh, how do you make it easy for the users to, to decide what kind of uh, documents they want to have uh, available offline and which one not, and how to like uh, delete them again? So, um, and then there's the thing with local and non-local data. So. For us, we had the functionality of searching through all of the documents, which was a search against our backend. But what happened if the user really fast uh, entered a lot of uh, data and just created new documents? It, I was talking about that five-second cycle. So it took, in the worst case, five seconds until the server 
actually knew about the changes, and then it still needed to synchronize. So when they were doing this really fast and then searching, they couldn't even find the search re the result that they just entered a, a second ago, which was really not a nice user experience. So this is still something. There's that was one example for that the search. There's multiple examples where user experience is still not as nice as with not or with uh, only online applications. And uh, I, think I only have a couple of minutes left, so uh, a few last hints that helped us. Uh, challenge the requirements um, of your clients or uh, for whomever you're building software. Um, it's the same thing as with challenging what needs to work offline. Um, do offline uh, first and, and early. It's like the mobile first, do the offline first thing, because usually that determines how your architecture should look like. And um, we all know that uh, architecture is the thing that's hard to change. And um, also explore the possibilities. Offline is not only something that you can use when your client says, we want to go offline, it's also something that you can use to enhance user experience. For example, if you want to um, do a cross-browser copy and paste, or a cross, um, sorry, a cross-tab copy and paste, something you can uh, implement yourself and use, um, uh, use local storage for that and save it in local storage, especially if you want to enhance the data while copying and pasting and transform a bit. So there's actually um, these HTML5 technologies can be used for more than that. And uh, yeah, that's me. And thanks a lot. And also special thanks to my colleague Johannes, who uh, helped me a lot with uh, this presentation. Thanks. <laughs>